Welcome back, everybody. Did you have some good flavored discovery tastings out there? Got some new ideas, inspiration? Good. Are we, are we thrilled by starting Worlds of Flavor again? We had some great stories in that first session. Ready for another session? Yeah, yeah. There we go. We got it. We're getting there. Um, so without further ado, I'm introducing our next moderator for the next session. Um, probably a very familiar name for many of you, Brett Thorne, coming from Nation's Restaurant News. And I actually did verify with Brett that he has been with Nation's Restaurant News since 1999, um, spotting and reporting on trends across the country. So I think if there's anybody who can sort of tell you where we've come in terms of the industry and where we're headed, it is probably Brett. Um, but for today, we're gonna rely on him to moderate our next session. So please help me welcome Brett Thorne. What a nice introduction, thank you. Uh, I'm very excited for this session. Culture, roots, and storytelling influences from Honduras to New Orleans, and from Iran and Honolulu to San Francisco. I am considerably more lazy than Kelly, so I'm just gonna tell you that these amazing chef's bios are on the Worlds of Flavor app, and you can look it up. <laughs> Uh, our first chef is the awesome Hanif Sadr, who is chef and co-founder of Komaj Foods in San Francisco, and he's gonna show us some California ingredients that also are Iranian ingredients, among other things. Take it away, Hanif. Hello, everyone. It's, it's really uh, a great pleasure to be here with you. Uh, my uh, friend and culinary assistant today, Amanda, is going to help me because I have a lot to say and, and I want to wrap it up in the 17 minutes. <laughs> uh, um, so, just um, if I want to be quick, my name is Hanif Saad. I'm a chef or a cook. Uh, I live in Bay Area. My small cafe restaurant is in San Francisco and my company is uh, Comage. Um, I was born in uh, France, but grew up in Tehran, the capital of Iran, um, mostly raised by my grandparents, which they are from northern Iran. Um, uh, I spent most of my summers and most of the holidays in northern Iran, so I'm so connected uh, to what they do, uh, how they live, and what's the natural and geographical situation in northern Iran, which is very close to northern California. Um, here, uh, we um, we cook the food from northern Iran, and today I'm going to show you the, a very simple um, stew, which um, is going to help me to kind of explain uh, some details about why we cook, cook it, how we cook it, and uh, what are the connections between here and northern Iran mostly. So um, the, the stew that we cook today is called Fesenjana Peste, Fesenjan basically is a general name for an Iranian stew based on nuts. Um, walnut is a main uh, ingredient, but you can see different um, variations of this stew. And today we are cooking the, the, the version from southern Iran, which is based on pistachios. Um, we have, you know, uh, Iranian cuisine, cook, um, cooking is, is all about long time of um, cooking, so I'm not going to do any, a lot of the cooking techniques here. We just show you how we as assemble the stew and let it cook, and we have the already cooked um, stew here. Uh, if you can turn the stew on, and also the other one. So simply, um, fesenjan is um, the combination of two to three main ingredients. Not which you uh, take, put, put it into powder and like, turn it into very kind of a paste-like um, kind of a nut butter, and then you saute it a little bit, and then you add, and you can use this, yes, and then you add pomegranate juice and pomegranate um, molasses, a little bit of the water, and let it cook for hours and hours. As, as it goes more, the color will change and the flavors will um, emerge. So, um, in the case of Fesenjan, um, there are animal protein and also vegetables that you can use. Here, we have already cooked meatballs. 
that we will add to it and cook it together. The, the flavors are mostly um, sweet and sour, or sour, depends on which region the stew is being cooked. Um, so um, by cooking the walnut and having, having it cook until the oil is out, you kind of um, create the body for the stew, and then you add the sauteed um, or go, um, golden onions, which create a, a kind of a deep flavor for the stew. Um, and, I, and then uh, I think, yeah, I think I lost my voice. But no, so, <laughs> so you add the onions, and then after adding the onions, um, you add the souring or um, the, the flavoring agent, which is in this case molasses. Um, and cooking it all together, after the stew is kind of mature and set, you add the animal protein or vegetables or beans to it and let it cook for a long time. Um, based on the region that the stew is being cooked, you, you see different variations of it and different ingredients. So north, northeast and northwest, you see more walnuts. In the western side of Iran, you see more almonds. And in central and southern Iran, you see the use of pistachios, where all the pistachios are grown. Um, for the animal proteins, it can be varied from dog to chicken to lamb to fish. Um, and um, you, you see different, like, it, it can be like a pieces of lamb meat or a meatball with beef, uh, with ground beef. It, it easily depends on um, the, the city or the village you try or the region that it grows. Sorry, that, wait, was the first protein you said dog? Dog. Oh, duck. Okay. Yes, sorry, no dog. <laughs> duck. Oh, whatever, <laughs> you know. I, I don't judge, I just ask. <laughs> no. Okay. The dog version is from northern Iran. Um, for the vegetables... <laughs> but for the, for the veggies, eggplants, pumpkin, apricots, raisins, uh, different types of beans, lentils, all um, in different combinations can be incorporated um, into this stew. So we can add the, the pomegranate, just like half the thing is good. Yeah. So some people would um, saute their nuts more because they believe that it brings out the flavor, but traditionally they just add the, add the water and the juice like right after they're adding the nuts or sauteing the nuts for a little bit. For the um, molasses, there are many different types of molasses that they use for making this stew. Uh, I brought some of the examples here, but it can be varied from like sweet pomegranate, sour pomegranate, sour orange, sour apples, melder, quince, barberries, all these different types of molasses. Like here, I brought four different type of molasses for, to just um, show you the different colors. I, I, you cannot taste it for sure, but um, these are all three different wild plum molasses that we forage in Northern California and we cook it ourselves. So this is like yellow, green, and red plum molasses. And here you see the, the sour orange molasses, the um, barberries and uh, lemon pulp molasses, and also the local California um, pomegranate molasses, which we cooked here at the restaurant. We made here at the restaurant. So in uh, this stew today, we use a pomegranate molasses from um, a grocery store, which is uh, kind of sweet and sour. You cannot sa uh, find sour pomegranates or sour pomegranate molasses here. The one grows up in northern Iran or just the one that is really sour. But plum molasses will help, the sour orange, orange molasses also really help. Um, the, the last ingredient that is, plays a huge role in this kind of technique is uh, herbs. Normal herbs like parsley, cilantro, mint, green onion, dill, um, and also wild ones like blue beringo, wild nettles, wild mints, um, um, white mints, and um, sorrel all being used in different parts, mostly in north and northeastern side of Iran. Herbs plays a huge role in this stew. Did, did you add the molasses? Not yet. Yeah, if you can add a little bit of it. Go a little bit further, yes. Absolutely, and then if you can stir it. So, um, one thing which is important is to have the consistency in the stew, so you can let it cook for a few hours. So um, then the color will change, and the 
the, when, when the oil is getting on top of this too, you know that uh, this is ready to, to be served. This stew is the very, the most simple version of what, what I just explained. As you can see, it has nuts and pomegranate molasses and water and the juice. And um, you can make it without the juice. So it's basically, most of it is preserved. So that's why it's so popular all around Iran. The origin of the stew is in northern Iran, but um, it, they, it's, it's been cooked in different parts based on the available nut trees that they have and also the available fruit that they could make a, a molasses out of it. Um, by, by seeing this and by um, mentioning that Iran has more than seven different types of climate and geographical uh, regions, uh, you see how that uh, recipe has already uh, traveled. Um, we can add the water now, yes. You can see how the recipe is traveled already domestic, domestically based on the available ingredients. So if you want to make it anywhere in the world, you can substitute the, the, the nuts with like cashew or um, pecan. You can use pork for the animal protein, or you can like, use cauliflower or broccoli instead of like squash or butternut squash or eggplant. Um, the, as you go north, the, the flavor will go towards sour side, but as you go south in Iran, the flavors will go to sweet and sour, and also very sweet side, uh, which is the, the, the beauty of um, this, um, this stew. Um, as, as, as we cooked this stew and the different versions of it, and based on what we learned in Iran and what we tried to bring it uh, from northern Iran here to northern California, we understood that there is a very um, nice um, idea to kind of follow, uh, which is uh, cooking regional Iranian cuisine uh, outside of Iran um, and, and focusing on the idea of like um, finding similarities in climate and geographical situation and after that finding similarities in different ingredients, I mean local ingredients that grows in different regions. Um, we cook northern Iranian food in northern California because the climates are almost the same the key ingredients that grows here in Northern California are part of our cuisine. Lots of herbs, walnuts and pistachios, pomegranates, and sour orange, queens, apples. All these ingredients are already being a part of our gastronomy for centuries at least. Um, so we try to constantly go back to Iran, spend time in Northern Iran and learn more and more learn more recipes and techniques and learn more about the ingredients, their flavor profiles, and come back here, uh, get connected to farmers and go more to the nature, forage more, and uh, learn about different markets and different um, ingredients to try to kind of cook the same dishes uh, and, and look at our gastronomy as kind of a, a knowledge that we can bring here as a technique and just um, incorporate into what we do and stay dedicated into their thousands or hundreds of years of cooking. Um, you know, just to um, wrap, wrap up, um, what we think is like Iran, since it's been in the heart of Silk Road, um, and it's, it, it is the 18th largest country in the world, um, you know, uh, um, Chinese started and Silk Road because they wanted to trade with Persians. Um, the main routes of Silk Road, all of them are cross, crosses Iran. You, can, you cannot skip Iran if you go west to east or east to west. So we have been receiving and giving lots of ingredients and techniques to east and west, and we could grow many ingredients that they come from east and west uh, because we had different regions, uh, in, climate-wise and geographically. So we could grow them in a farm scale, and they became part of our cuisine, as well as the, the ingredients and technique that we gave to the East and West. So, um, you know, Iran uh, has a subtropical weather in north to the, one of the hottest places on Earth in the Lut Desert, to the snow-covered um, Mount Damavand, which is the highest, which is the second highest volcano in Asia. Um, you know, Iran is located in Asia continent, and Iranian consider themselves Asians, uh, <laughs> but Western Asians, right? Not Middle Easterns, basically. 
um, and um, through that um, different, um, situa different geographical situations, their cuisine is so varied. Um, and it can be applied in different regions of the world based on the similarities that you can find um, in, in, the, in the regions. Um, here, as an example, like, you know, wood sorrel, um, it's a very um, fancy ingredient, I would say, but in northern Iran, and they, they sell piles of it at the market, like piles, like, you know, because they, they turn it into a stew and soup, not just for the garnish. But today, I'll, I'll use it for the garnish. I just picked them up um, at, the, at the garden. Um, thank you. So this, um, this too, as you can see the difference in, in the color, if you let it cook for a few hours, it will turn into this color. If I just want to show you the... If you see, the, the oil here is all mostly not oil. A little bit of canola oil from the sauteing there, um, the nuts and a bit of from the onions, but as you can see, um, this oil is a combination of nut oil and uh, canola oil. So this looks um, perfect to me, um, and it shows. Oh shit! Sorry. Um, <laughs> I, I, let me clean it up. Okay. So the final stage for this stew to let it go is to add the uh, onions. Um, and then, like after one hour or a little, little bit more, it's ready to, to add the, the animal protein to it. So I have the, this version of it with meatballs, which I'm going to plate, but I have three more to just show you the, the different um, variations of... And Chef, those onions, they're just caramelized onions? The, yes, they are already caramelized, okay. yes. Use this. I try to get more of the oil to, just to show you how the oil can get out. And that's enough. Thank you. And let me just dig in some meatballs here. And, and what kind of meat is that, the meatballs? Jeff? It's a beef meatballs. But normally, in Iran, it would be a lamb meatball. But here, we just made it with... And, and why did you cook those meatballs in? Excuse me? Why, why did you cook the meatballs in? So we uh, traditionally, they sauteed the meatballs, we roast the meatballs, but then you add it to this too and let it cook together. So barberries, which is a very traditional berries in Iran, would add a good flavor to this one. Um, and then this is the, the seedless lemon that we pickled with saffron, caraway seeds, and dill stems, which is kind of from the city that my grandparents are from. Um, this stew is a bit sweet to me, so I would like to add a bit of a pickle on the side. But these two are the, uh, the other versions. It has lots of herbs in it, like this two has parsley, cilantro, mint, green onion, and chives. And the molasses in these two is um, sour orange molasses. I have one minute. This is roasted um, squash with the, same, with the same stew. Roasted squash with the same stew. This is dock. I'm just going to add a bit of a herbs to make it a little bit more beautiful since the color is not good. And this one, it's a roasted smoked mackerel. In northern Iran, we eat a lot of smoked fish. And uh, we have one fish, which is kafal, and very close to mackerel. That's why we cook mackerel here at the restaurant, plus trout and salmon and sardines. Uh, that's it. Thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you, Hanif. That was great.
Uh, I asked our next chef, Melissa, how to pronounce her last name. She said, just say Arujo the American way. You'll never get it right. So, so now to uh, produce another stew, but this is a Honduran one uh, that reflects Mayan, African, and other cultures from Honduras, Honduras is Melissa Arujo from the Arujo Restaurant Group in New Orleans. Please welcome her. Hey guys, so um, who opens a restaurant in the middle of pandemics? Uh, I decided to open one and it happens to be uh, my heritage, Honduran cuisine. I am 25% native Mayan Indian with uh, Portuguese and then my mother walks in and then the Italian comes out and everything, but that's another story. Uh, so we in Alma. I decided to pay homage to my heritage. And this particular dish that I'm gonna be cooking today does that. It's, we're from the coast. There is a line in my website in Alma, there's a picture that is clearly, I did not take. My father took it when he was a um, teenager, many years ago, he's in the 90s now, you know. Um, and the quote that's there, I, it's the way that I feel because as a kid, going to Honduras and learning my heritage, uh, those mountains, we, the cities nestle in the foot on the, on the mountains, you know? And then you have the Atlantic Ocean and everything. So basically what I did here, I put olive oil and then I put the Trinity. So it's onions, gar uh, onions, uh, celery, and bell peppers. And I'm also going to put the garlic in there. And I'm gonna get a nice little peppers right here for heat a little bit. Just gonna do a nice little rough chop. So the ghost says, let me see if I remember correctly, it says, in the foot of the hills of this, of this mountains, the salty air, the sunrise, everything reflects my childhood. Something like that, I think, I don't remember, but it goes like that. And what I try to do with Alma is do that. I learned a long time ago that food is memory. And when I want, when you walk through Alma, the decoration is very simple. The pictures are not mock-up. They're my family pictures. There is the story of my family. Actually, they say never work with family, but my sous chef is my sister, my big, older sister, which is 11 years older than me. So she's working for her baby sister. Uh, so you get it down, you know, going through it about 10 to 15 minutes, sweating it. You add a little bit of salt and this, yeah, this is the wine. So she's the traditional part because she's a home, a, uh, a chef thought home cook. Basically, she's been cooking all my life. I got the love of cooking from the woman in my family and she was one of them. She defined the person who I am today, her, my mother and my other sister. And it took a long time for me to feel very comfortable in my skin and understand all three cultures basically who makes me the Hispanic side, the Italian side and the American side. Through my teenager years, I struggle a lot finding who I really was and then when my mother got sick with Alzheimer's, I quit fine dining and returned home. And I started cooking back in New Orleans. And out of that, after a while, three years, I decided to quit cooking. And I don't know why I went into construction. I don't know. So this was uh, seafood stock. They made a lovely, uh, uh, lobster stock for me, eh, which I thanked them very much. I mean, I got here yesterday and there were 90% everything done. I was like, oh yes, thank you. 
<laughs> you know, so you let it consume for a couple of minutes. You can do this usually, I do it in medium high heat. So, oh, there you go. This is the most important ingredient. I'm not gonna slave hours. There is now ways to do it. So this little package, uh, we're gonna put the finger there, but you can find it in every Spanish store. It uh, says, uh, sopa de crema de mariscos. So creamy seafood uh, soup. This is the base to this soup um, because literally it would take hours to do and we don't have that time and modern time. So I use this in the restaurant too. It's just the base that which it gives it a little bit more flavor. So we have that once we have all these ingredients in here. Yeah, so I pick construction and after a year of working, I was ready to go back to the kitchen. Um, I missed it and something clicked back like, hey, I need to go back. And but this time something different happened. I knew who I was. I didn't want to do any more fine dining. So I, this is a time where you put the chicken, uh, the, uh, not the chicken, sorry, the fish. And, and, and sorry, what kind of fish is that? Huh? What kind of fish is that? I think this is a snapper. So you start cooking it the snappers, you put the scallops and, uh, sorry, I forgot the name, the uh, clams. Thank you. And here are the scallops and the oysters. So this is a very, oops, fire, that's not good. This is a very uh, rich, rich uh, stew, actually. Uh, La Ceiba is very abundant of seafood. And the uh, heritage of this dish has its beginnings from the Spanish, the African, uh, African slaves that crashed uh, basically in the coast of Honduras and the Bay Islands. And after that, once they found themselves, you know, in Honduras, they were able to be free and keep the culture intact and their heritage and basically mixed in with the native Indians and the Spanish. So this is a combination of that. Uh, then you throw in the uh, saffron, cumin, I do not recognize that. <laughs> and I think this is paprika. You know, when you pass a recipe to your marketing director and the marketing director is not a, a chef, and then you get a phone call, you're like, hey, how you do this? I'm like, oh, let me explain to you. And so, yeah, it works, works wonders. We are worries, but so, This is the part where we should have made one ahead, but no, we can. So you let it cook. You basically just put a lid into it. And the last part is going to be the coconut cream. Hi. That what is makes it more yummy. You know, if you're one of those weird person like I am, this is the only way I like coconut. So the color, if you can see on the screen, it's going to turn like a little bit creamy and white, and that's what you're looking for. So you cover this. Do we have a lit back, uh, back there for me? No? Do we have a lit? So once you cover it, a couple of minutes, eh, about 20, 25 minutes later, ah, thank you. So all you're doing now is just cooking the seafood. Let's move that before it gets on fire again. 
Um, so yeah, I went back to the kitchen and I was a different person. I knew what I wanted out of the kitchen. I knew the flavors that I wanted to cook. And that meant cooking my heritage. I created first my first business, which was Severe Catering, which was one of the first catering companies in New Orleans to be farm to table. I wanted it to cook like I was cooking in Italy, like I grew up cooking with, in my mother's kitchen, in my grandmother's kitchen. And it took time, you know. And after that, when I, that was where, uh, ready and it was stable, um, in the middle of the craziness of the pandemic, I decided to open Alma. And also a nasty divorce, but we're not going to go there. <laughs> so, um, you know, I decided to open Alma, and the, uh, the idea was coming to my table. I named it Alma because it means soul. I was getting literally... You know, my, my soul was getting naked and opening to everybody and figuring and showing who I truly was. For a person, for a human being, that can be very vulnerable and scary sometimes, but this is who I am, you know. And I wanted also to show that Honduran cuisine can be elegant, it can be everything. You know, I went to, for four years, I went to different investors. Every investor told me, you're crazy, this will not work, this is peasant food. Oh, guess what? The best food in the world is peasant. You know, every culture, the peasant food is the one that is best. And now we have it in fancy restaurants, we put it everywhere, it's just different cultures, different names, more popular and everything. Honduran hasn't had that, that yet, you know? So I sit down with my sister and I was like, if we're going to do this, we're going to do it this way. And we're going to like everything in my life. I'm not knocking. I'm kicking the door open. And yeah, so we opened in the middle of pandemic and Literally me, I text a couple of texts to the food critics, to the bloggers, everything, every connection that I had in New Orleans. And I thought the goal was to sit down with my accountant, a thousand dollars a day to survive with a minimum crew. And we blew that out of the water since we opened because I took all my experience. I knew I needed a system to deliver delivery food and I need I knew that the city was open 75% back, back capacity inside and full capacity outside. So I took advantage of that. I didn't go with the regular delivery systems like Uber Eats or anything like that. I went with something new, Chow Now, that I only paid $136 a fee a month for that, and then I kept all my profit. And we started social media completely like two months before we opened. So we got everybody excited. And yeah, we blew out of the water enough that my restaurant only sits 84 people. And last Sunday, I got my ass kicked to 300. <laughs> so this, and the most part is you go to Alma and this is flavors that you, you don't expect out of Central American food. I don't want to say Central American cuisine because it's not Central American cuisine. You can define it in different regions, and that depends. I am from Honduras. Like uh, there was a discussion, actually a fight on Facebook. Uh, a couple of clients, one of them wanted me to put in my menu saying that my beans are not vegan. So my answer was, I am Honduran. If you know what that means, it means my beans are gonna got pork fat in it. You know, that's the yummy part. And, and, and he was like, well, usually Hispanic beans are, are vegan. I'm like, usually Mexican beans are vegan. I'm Hispanic, I am Hispanic, but I am Honduran. So that means we use the pork, I went like, we use the coin coin a lot, you know? So, see, now you can start smelling it. Mm. So, oh, thank you, Chef. You can start smelling all the flavors in it, the, the coconut, the cumin, the paprika, the saffron, everything. So, this is where come handy all the fancy skills that you have learned to time. And we start plating it. 
So the discussion was, they started fighting, and I was like, I'm out of here. You know, you can fight yourself. I'm not putting that my beans are, are not vegan. The menu's staying the same. But, yeah, it's funny because you go in, it's not what you expected. A lot of people is like, hey, where are the chips? I'm like, no, we're not Mexicans. There's no chips. <laughs> I was, I, I, it, it was to the point, I was like, read the logo, please. It says, Alma, Modern Honduran's Eatery. So that means no chips and no salsa. <laughs> oh. So you get the nice, fancy setup. And then the stew goes all over. And we actually, in Alma, we serve it like this, but in a bigger bowl. And... Can everyone smell this? It's incredible. So yeah, so, and then to make it a little bit. So usually in Honduras, they go in, they go fishing, and they grab the blue crabs, and they basically just kill them, clean them up, and they put them, the whole thing, in, in the soup, you know. We're not going to do that here. And I don't, I, I, I did it once in Alma, and it was too messy, to be honest. So now we just get the nice crab meat, and we put it there. And that's it. Yeah. So, simple dish that actually defines my childhood. So, I hope that when you do this, because the recipe is online, right, Chef? Uh, you can relate and open a new memory and a new experience. Thank you. Thank you. That was so good. And we have another chef. We have... Uh, Gabby Maida, who is the executive chef of State Bird Provisions in San Francisco. Everybody, welcome Gabby. Hello. All right. Hi, thank you for being here today. My name is Gabby Maida, and I'm the chef at State Bird Provisions in San Francisco. Uh, for those of you who know State Bird, we are a California restaurant at, the Fil at Fillmore Street. Um, before the pandemic, we were a dim sum style restaurant that had small plates with a lot of California cuisine. Now we've transitioned into a more traditional setting of coursed out meals and a la carte and whatnot. But the food has still remained the same and it's still very delicious. So today I'm gonna to be talking about a childhood favorite snack of mine called Inari. Now traditionally Inari is a fried tofu pocket. They take a block of tofu, they fry it till it's crispy, and then they, the interior is like a beautiful webbing, creates a nice little pocket for the seasoned rice that goes inside. So those of you that know, this is what it looks like. You'll see it at sushi restaurants, um, Japanese markets, at Hawaii 7-Eleven. And uh, in Hawaii, we actually call it cone sushi. The reason being is that we don't cut it horizontally, we cut the tofu pocket diagonally. So it has a more triangular, triangular shape, and hence the name Kone Sushi. Now, you can find those items at uh, Okazuya's, which translates to oh, like a snack shop where you can get a plate of rice and noodles, a side of rice, <laughs> spam, and Japanese pickles, and little simmered vegetables. Now these shops, growing up in Honolulu, were probably my favorite places. I actually ended up taking my first job at one of these places. It was called Sakia's in uh, Kaimuki, which is the, you know, the neighborhood I'm from, if you guys are familiar. So I think that the Inari is a really perfect bite because it has the right level of salty, sweet, acidic from the vinegar, and umami. And now at State Bird, what we try to do is reimagine it through the lens of a California chef, and more specifically, a chef from the Bay Area. So we use a lot of products that are local to where we are, as well as a little extra 
things from around the country that you know sometimes we use on occasion. So um, for the first thing we're gonna do, I have a bunch of different steps here. We have sushi rice that we cook, standard issues, just sushi rice, water, and then what we wanna do is add it to our bowl. And it's nice and like singular gra uh, grains, and then we wanna add our farro verde. Now, farro verde is a grain from Anson Mills, which is based out of Columbia, South Carolina. The reason why we really like it is that it's a small producer of organic heirloom grains that you know is trying to keep this alive. And so why we also enjoy it is that it has a natural smokiness to it. They take the branches, they kind of thresh it, and they kind of scorch it, and then shake out all the grains. So what we do is that we cook it with a little bit of kombu, which, as you can see here, is a piece of kelp, Japanese kelp or seaweed. So the kombu adds really nice umami. As you can see, all the white little salt on it, that's from the glutamic acids. I'm going to adjust your oh. microphone a little Thank bit. you. It's because I'm going to talk about MSG. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Glutamic acids, meaning MSG. MSG. And so this is a really nice natural way to do it. I have honestly no problem with the powdered form because I grew up using hondashi, which is another great way to get a lot of uh, flavor. So we cook the farro with that, we strain it out, and then we reserve that liquid for further use, which I will explain a little bit down the road. Um, so we're gonna do that. And it's kind of like two parts rice, one part farro verde, and one part red quinoa. And so the quinoa we use a lot at the restaurant because one, it's super healthy. Um, it's texturally really beautiful. Uh, there's a nice toothsomeness to it. It helps bind the nari filling itself. And um, to me, it, it makes me feel like I'm being somewhat healthy. So I like that. So we're gonna add a little bit of that. Okay. So you kind of want to see a nice like multi-grain aesthetic to the mixture. Um, if you feel like you need a little bit more of something, you just kind of add it in. Um, but the quinoa itself is also cooked in the same way as the farro. That way everything has a little bit of flavor development and everything has like just the right level of umami. Oh, that's um, so pretty. Thank you. Um, to this, we're going to add a little ginger shift, which is what we call it at the restaurant, but it's shift and odd. So you take ginger, you slice it really thin, and then you like cut it as thin as you can. It's really like bright and adds a nice little like heat to it. And then some sliced scallions. Um, we're really lucky to work with a lot of great farms at State Bird. Um, this one is from Hikari, which is located in Watsonville. So we get, you know, scallions or shiso, sometimes cabbage for kimchi and whatnot, but anything we can, local, organic, and as well, you know, supporting small businesses. It's a huge part of what we do as chefs and honestly as diners too. So we're gonna add a little bit of the scallion all of it, I'm just gonna add all. <laughs> it's really good. And then uh, some golden sesame seeds. So these we actually get from a company called Japanese Pantry, and they procure a lot of great ingredients from Japan. Um, Wadaman is the name of the sesame like, producer. Really, really great, so we love all of that. And the seeds themselves actually are dusted with a little bit of uh, ume powder, which I will also explain a little later, but this is what umeboshi is. If you guys are familiar, it's uh, Japanese salted plum that is usually done with some shiso and salt and fermented for like, you know, a long time, like up to a year. Um, so what we do is we take that shiso from the ferment and we squeeze out some of the liquid, put it in a dehydrator sheet, dry it out as best as we can, and it's now a seasoning salt. And we do this a lot at Sabird whether it's sauerkraut or kimchi powder. Kind of, you can do whatever you want there. So we kind of just mix everything there. And then, at this point, you guys remember that uh, liquid I was talking about with the farro? So, now what we want to do is poach shiitakes in that because that liquid has now not just a smoky grain, not just one layer of umami. Adding another layer, such as mushroom, creates a really, really delicious broth. And you're going to see how we kind of take one dish and like 
add elements and layers of flavor and not waste anything too. I think that's a big part of cooking these days is not wasting anything and just you know paying our respects to it. So we poached the shiitakes in that liquid. So we're gonna add that in as well. And some of the juice in there is really great too because it's just flavor at this point. And yet again, thank you. Yet again, we uh, saved that liquid for another use because with those three elements of smoke and two levels of uh, umami, we've now made our own vegan grain dashi, which is really awesome. And kind of the whole point of the tofu pocket that was fried and braised in dashi, it's kind of like there's the like parallels there. So it's really awesome. And at this point, we're gonna take some sesame oil and a little chili oil. And so the chili oil is yet another product that we make in the restaurant. We take a bunch of red Fresno chilies, grind it up, press out the juices, and salt the pulp, and let it ferment for about three days. And then at that point, we flood it with a neutral oil like grapeseed, or you know, you could use anything else that has no flavor too much. And then you kind of cook it on the stove top for a few hours, and then you can also pop it in the oven and bake it for like four hours, and it really just extracts all of the spiciness, all of the salt, and all of that like funky chili. So we kind of dress that there too. You kind of want a lot because you want it to be a really malleable mixture. And then uh, kosho. So kosho is a really great condiment using a lot of Japanese food. Um, we love using a lot of farm things that, you know, sometimes may not always be the best to hit the plate. So for example, we had these kishu mandarins. They weren't really the best for eating. You know, they kind of lack sweetness. They were just a little drier. So what we wanted to do is not waste all of the hard work that the farm produced and essentially turned it into kosho. So we took the mandarins, we ground them down, added salt, some Thai chilies, and we let it ferment for about nine months. Um, creates a really beautiful paste. It's funky, it's bright, it's got love, like acidity and salt levels to it as well. And then we kind of turned it into a vinaigrette. So we use yuzu juice, some sesame oil, some uh, ginger garlic, which is a really common ingredient in our food. So this kind of acts as like the vinegar would in a sushi rice filling. All right. So... For us, I have yet another one set aside here, which is really great. So that's what I'm gonna to use to actually roll the inari. And what we're gonna roll it in is this sheet. So this sheet is yuba, which is the skin of tofu, or actually the skin of soy milk that forms when you heat up your soy milk to about 150 degrees. Um, at that time, it takes about 40 minutes to create the right thickness, the right texture of the yuba. So Hodo Soy is a place that we really enjoy using as well because it's local. It's from West Oakland. We've been to the factory. It's just a fantastic operation. Um, it takes one guy 40 minutes to cut his yuba because there's like a large room that has about 60 vats. So in, in an hour, he can pull up 60 sheets of yuba, which is Pretty spectacular. So I'm gonna actually use this side um, to do the rolling here. Thank you. Okay. So, so at the restaurant, what we do, we take our Yuba. Sometimes we like will split it in half if we don't want to have too much waste and you can kind of get more out of a small amount. But for this one, we're going to use the whole sheet. So you kind of, just like how you would make a maki roll, you want to fill your, you know, whatever you're rolling it in pretty tightly and not too much. You don't want to overstuff it. But everything in here is just like the perfect balance and kind of helps one another, you know, sing. So just like that. And then this is uh, another ingredient from Hikari that we love. It's called komatsuna. 
It's um, like a Japanese mustard green. So it's just like really beautiful. Um, we just blanch it, shock it in nice water, and then it looks really, really nice kind of put together here. We wanna, when we cut it, we wanna see like the grains, we wanna see a little pop of green. Okay, so you're gonna take your sheet, kind of roll it over, just like you would a sushi roll. And actually, tie this a little tighter. Okay. So you wanna roll it up, and then pretty much roll it like you would um, a log of compound butter or you know, a torsion. So you kind of like put it on the table. If the table has like the right level of moisture, it'll really like ca capture it really well. But if it's not, you can always like spray a little water on it. So what we do is we kind of tie the, oops, sorry. We tie the uh, ends either with tape or with twine. Um, and you want to let it set for like a few hours. Like at least, you know, we do this in the early part of the day. We serve it at five o'clock, so it has its time. And then we uh, serve it with a few things, actually. Um, a couple things that we reused. We have the dressing, which has the umeboshi paste in it. So what we do is we like take out the pit, we take out the skin, and just kind of puree the fruit. The dressing is like a very lightened version of aioli. It has egg yolk, the umeboshi paste, a little bit of the kosho, some ginger garlic and grapeseed oil, but not so dense. You don't want to have like globs of mayonnaise, you know, as you're eating this. You want something really light. You want to kind of keep with that health theme, but not really. You know, it's more about flavor at this point. Um, so we really like it. Um, the ume we use, we actually didn't have shiso in it, which is usually the red shiso. I think it looks really nice. I think that the color is really like just, it's neutral and you can really play with everything else. So, let's see here. So we just put a little bit on the bottom of the plate. And this is something that's on the menu currently. And actually, continuing the theme of feeding family, I got to feed my mom this, which is really great. And she enjoyed it. It made her feel nostalgic even on the mainland. So when we cut the inari, you want to cut it where it's you know as tall as it is wide. Um, sometimes you know we have little end pieces. It's like the chef's favorite snack. Um, I think halfway through the night, all of us are like, you know, hungry and family meal has finally settled and we're like, oh my God, is there inari for us to eat right now? Because it's just, it's really delicious. You know, it has a lot of protein. It has like great complex carbs and it just, it sustains you during service, which is really beautiful. And then at this point, you have your pieces, and like I said, you can kind of see that little pop of green um, with all of the nice textural pieces. You can see the quinoa, you can see the farro, and the rice, and some of the chili, which is really beautiful. And you kind of just want to put it, you know, in the center of the well of mayonnaise, essentially. And then um, what we like to do is add a little more of that kosho vin, just like a light last minute addition of brightness, just so it really sings because, you know, a really simple plate like this is gonna be, needs to say a lot without looking like it's gonna say a lot. So we take some of that ume shiso gomasio, put it right over the top, finish it with a little chili oil, just to kind of like reinforce all the flavors that went into this the first time and at this point, we have like beautiful micro shisos. Um, you know, you can really, you can't go wrong with beautiful microgreens. They pack a lot of flavor in a really small, small package. And this is exactly what it looks like. So you have kind of, you have our version at Seabird next to the original idea that I probably ate at least 250 pieces of by the time I was 10. And you know, this little pocket was such an important thing for me as a kid because I was not quite there to actually eat raw fish at a sushi restaurant. It was either this or tamago, which is like egg. 
Um, so it really like made me feel nostalgic, and I think food should do that. It should make you feel nurtured and taken care of, especially during the times that we've had over the last year. Um, yeah, it just it should really bring you back. But you can kind of see the parallels of the rice fillings and the yuba acting as the tofu pocket, and just kind of you can have a lot of fun. We can put smoked trout. You can put smoked black cod. You can put meats if you wanted to. You could just keep it vegetarian. There's a whole mess of ways you could do this. So that is the Yuba Shiitake Inari with salted plum dressing and kosho. Thank you guys so much. Cool. That was awesome. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you to Brett for moderating the session, getting out of the way and letting the chefs do all of the talking. I think it's been amazing this first, these first two um, sessions and the six chefs that we've seen. Just, it reminds me, this, this demo, I feel like, just especially reminds me why we need restaurants and why we need professional chefs and to take something that is humble, like, you know, tofu skins and rice and turn it into this amazing thing with all of these complex elements that nobody is going to do at home, but you need to go out and have a professional chef do for you. So just another round of applause for all of our chefs for helping show us that. And now I'm guessing you want to try some of this food that you've been seeing and actually taste it for yourself. So we are going to our very first world marketplace. Um, and as part of that marketplace, Chef Hanif's beef meatballs with pistachio and pomegranate stew um, is going to be available. So be sure to check that out. Um, the Yuba and shiitake and nari that we just saw will be featured at tomorrow's lunch marketplace also. Um, tonight's marketplace is sponsored by Kikoman, who is our platinum sponsor. Um, and I hope that you get to try all of the things. We've also got some cultural entertainment uh, uh, elements as part of the marketplace also. So enjoy that. Uh, the marketplace is going to be taking place on the second floor. So actually from in here, you can go up to the top of the theater to exit and go through there. Um, in, and it's going to be um, throughout. As I mentioned earlier, we've kind of spread things out. So be sure to explore all parts of it. It's going to be in the Chuck Williams Culinary Arts Museum. It's going to be on the mezzanine. It's going to be on the balcony. Don't forget to look up while you're on the balcony because we've got some good surprises in there also. So just be sure to spread out and find all the places with all of the delicious food. Um, don't forget also to check out the Tiradito de Cobia Nippon being served by Chef Diego Oka and Andrew Hunter. Um, in the Kikamin booth. And then we'll be starting back here tomorrow. Breakfast is at 8 a.m. and our first session is back in here at 8.30 p.m. And we'll see you all then. Thanks very much, everyone. <laughs>
My brother has become our lead pit master now. He's been with me since the beginning, so six years. Uh, my sister is. Uh, yeah, head prep cook over she here. She works. Runs the she works every day, almost maybe six and a half days a week. And then she babysits her kids too. I do have another sister that will help out from time to time. She mostly she lives is in, like two minutes away from us. She's so. mostly involved with helping out with family stuff, watching our kids, or doing caterings and events. And I have uh, two cousins that have worked here for five years plus, and they are all involved with the barbecue because even though they had very little to zero restaurant experience coming in, they know the flavor and profiles I'm trying to push out based off my family's cooking. We source our meat from Harley Ranch, which is right outside uh, Waco in Stephensville. And, uh, you know, we've worked with these guys to be able to have, you know, a, a never ever, which means uh, an all natural brisket that's grass fed. We're using prime briskets. Most of their Angus cows are actually graded closer to prime. It's, it's important to me to know how a cow is living and how it's, what, what it's fed. So we use 100% mesquite wood, right? Um, in central Texas here, it's typical to use post oak or oak. I think it gives us a distinct flavor. I think when you're thinking about Mexican food or South Texas food, and you're thinking about asadas or grilled meats or whatever, you, or the, the al carbon uh, kind yes. of style, you're thinking of like hot, the grill, the smoke, the fire, right? And those flavors, when we add it to our barbecue, it kind of, it, it, it blends those two together and it brings, it, it brings that flavor out. Um, so those flavors you're getting from the asadas or, or carbones, when you do a long cook with the brisket, you're gonna have those elements there too. And that's the flavor I'm going for. So we use offset pits. We don't do reverse flow. There's like pits that are offset, but they're also reverse flow. Now we have this continuous flow going through here. Um, we use three quarter inch steel. This pit right here is a 36 inch barrel. The mesquite wood, we wanna burn a lot and be able to have coals so it can not be over smoked and continue to burn. So I, I like the space in the room in there and it does burn hot so I don't, I don't really need to keep, have an insulated firebox. So right now these don't have anything on them. We're gonna get ready to load them up with our, our brisket. We, we fit about one, two, three briskets here. We'll do about 21, 22 briskets on here. These are our whole chickens. They cook for about four hours, three and a half to four hours in the chicken. When, we, when we're cooking these whole chickens, we're gonna look for a crust to start developing again. And you're gonna see some of the juices are naturally coming out. These should be pushed over actually just a little bit more. They're a little bit too tight, too close to each other. But we're gonna know that the chicken is ready in about an hour and a half or so, just by taking the tail, okay? I'm gonna put slight pressure, and if it starts to pop off, we're gonna pull it. So this is a, the dry rub for the brisket. The beef ribs will take this on too. Beef ribs and brisket will kind of basically have this, this yes. combination right here. When we do pork, pork is super heavy on just a dry rub. Mm. And then we add more salt to it. And then once it, the pork gets wrapped, it's gonna hit brown sugar, so get a little sweetness to it. Here you're looking at a packer brisket. These are from Harley Ranch. They're 100% grass fed. Um, uh, black, uh, black Angus beef. Mm. Here, what we do is we're gonna we're gonna look at this brisket. So like we were talking about earlier when I was using my hand, showing you what the brisket looks like. So this is what I'm talking about, right? Flat point, the deco right in here. You have the fat. This fat's never gonna really render out as mm. much. But I also might trim out a little bit more than most people. So I'm going for some aesthetics and stuff too, right here. Now this fat will just kind of sit inside the brisket and never render out. So I'm gonna clean some of this out. And as I'm creating my cuts here, I'm gonna start creating the line to be able to have a quarter inch thick. We're gonna look for about a quarter inch right here yeah. and go about half inch on the on the fat side. We this, just ate it. This is from, from the deco without oh. the bottom part. This is in my opinion, yes, like the, the two best pieces of brisket that you can get. Mm. First breast. Yeah. Should we just like? This is our answer. <laughs> this is our answer to to white bread. It's a good in, answer. In the barbecue, you know. It's in the barbecue. Hard to answer back. In the barbecue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this can be eaten just like this and stand on its own. That's my goal. White bread, 
meat. <laughs> tortilla, yeah, that's my... But it's a good tortilla yeah. <laughs> and really good meat, you know, right? And so then these elements here, right, when we pair together, are to just kind of enhance the flavors and work well together and balance each other out, not to mask. This is what we normally serve sausage with. We take our mesquite, we make a habanero mustard here. So we take our mesquite smoked barbecue sauce. We smoke our barbecue sauce for like six hours. So it's very easy. It's like, it's ketchup, vinegar, Worcestershire. You make the sauce first and then you smoke it? So you smoke like it. cold smoke it? Yeah, I don't go about six hours. So what we're looking at right here, look at the nice little quarter inch of the fat. So all the love goes in before trimming, right? Yep. To kind of create this nice consistency here through each slice. So this is <clears throat> my opinion, right? Off the deck with some of the best slices that you'll get, even if you want to call burnt ends or whatever. But this stuff usually we mix and chop in our tacos so it has some bark in the mm. tacos. And this is just what's left from the meat that you kind of dug mm -hmm. from in between the two pieces, right? right? Wake up your taste buds with this breakfast flatbread featuring diced smoked ham, eggs, potatoes, and cheddar. First, preheat your oven to 425 degrees Fahrenheit. In a large non-stick skillet, heat the olive oil over medium heat, add the ham, and cook until the fat is rendered and the ham is crisp. It should take about eight minutes. Remove the crispy ham onto a paper towel lined plate. Next, add the onions to the pan season with salt and pepper and cook until very soft, about 10 minutes. Add the garlic and cook until just starting to brown. Deglaze the pan with a little water, then add the tomatoes and oregano. Cook until fragrant, about two minutes. Now we can get started on our flatbread. Brush the flatbread dough with some olive oil and then spread it with the onion mixture. Sprinkle with most of the cooked ham and pepper jack and spoon the ricotta in large dollops over the surface. Scatter the roasted potatoes over the flatbread. Top with the rest of the ham. Crack the eggs onto the flatbread so they're spaced evenly. Then, place the flatbread in the oven and bake for about eight minutes. Broil the flatbread for two minutes until the edges are crisp, the cheese is melted and lightly browned, and the eggs are cooked. Season with salt and pepper. Cut the flatbread into four pieces and scatter the torn basil leaves and chives over the top and serve immediately. So there you have it, our delicious breakfast flatbread featuring savory smoked ham, eggs, potatoes, and cheddar. Enjoy. Find this recipe and many more at ciaprochef.com slash ham. The Culinary Institute of America at Copia, in collaboration with Butter of Europe, is pleased to bring you Baking and Pastry Excellence, a free online educational series featuring the best in world baking and pastry. Today, we'll visit the Michelin three-star Atelier Crane in San Francisco. Pastry chef Juan Cotreras shows us the secrets in making his apple pot with candied pecans and caramel. Chef Contreras uses French butter to make his classic apple pot My name is Juan Contreras. I'm the pastry chef at Atelier Crane in San Francisco. 
today we made the apple pate choux. Take a classic pastry, which is the, the pate choux, which is your classic dough that you can bake and fill with uh, you know cheese or cream, like a cream puff or a gouge. Uh, in this case, we wanted to like make it look like an apple and kind of have those uh, reminiscent uh, tonalities of, and flavor profiles of uh, caramel apple as well. To make the pate choux dough, we take water, milk, sea salt, oil, butter from Europe, bring it up to temperature, bring it up to a simmer. We add the flour. Uh, mixture and then keep mixing the flour so that it gets absorbed into the liquid. Keep stirring until we um, basically quote unquote dry out the dough and you'll see that by kind of the, the flour, the dough mixture sticking to the bottom of the pan, get some of that residual crust on it, a little bit of a crust. Uh, as soon as you see that, we dump it into the stand mixer and cool it down uh, just around 50 Celsius. So once it comes around 50 Celsius, we start to incorporate the eggs. Uh, the eggs here, we basically just buzz them with a hand immersion blender. Uh, makes it a little more streamlined to actually incorporate the eggs until they're fully incorporated into the dough. Uh, put the dough into a piping bag. Into, uh, we have half uh, demi-sphere molds and we'll pipe the dough all until we use the entire uh, the entire batter. Remove some of the dimples and indentions on the, from the piping to just to kind of get it uh, as flat as possible. And then freeze uh, the molds until the batter is frozen. The crackling dough is also using the butter of Europe. It's a simple mixture of uh, butter, flour, and sugar, almost basically around equal parts, so a good amount of butter. The dough is made in a, just mixing it together with a little bit of a green uh, food coloring. You freeze it and then punch it out. Remove your frozen uh, pate choux uh, dough that's been molded in the half hemisphere. Put it on your sheet pan with a silk pond and then the round uh, crackling dough, we put a little uh, hat on top of it and then put it straight in the oven at 200 Celsius. And then after 15 minutes, uh, we'll lower the oven to about 150 Celsius for an extra 30 minutes just to uh, dry out. Um, so once it's cool, uh, use a serrated knife to cut them uh, at a perfectly uh, straight edge angle so that you can expose the inside. So for the plating, we take the pate choux that's been cut. We insert a tiny little uh, apple stem that's made out of chocolate and put it on top. In the inside of the cavity, we put a little bit of uh, caramel, salted caramel that we make. It's just a caramel sauce. Uh, we put um, some apple compote, which is just a compote that we make with uh, Fuji apples and Granny Smith apples, raw apple dices in there. And the raw apple is just a uh, apple that's been peeled and diced and it's there for freshness and texture. Uh, pecan praline, we pipe that in there as well. Pipe a little bit of the pecan uh, ice cream. And then we take the whipped ganache, pipe some of that around the uh, perimeter of the shoe. Finish it off with a little bit more um, pecan praline, some salt. We also garnish the sides around with uh, toasted pecans and some uh, candied apple and top it off with uh, its hat, the little top of the shoe and the stem. What I like about this dish is that it's, it's, it's very playful it's, and very nostalgic. Uh, people, when they eat it, they recognize those flavors right away. You know, nuts, caramel, apple, and it's a visual cue that it also tastes what it looks like. Watch more baking and pastry videos at ciaprochef.com slash butter. Hi, I'm Andrew Hunter, chef for Kikoman Sales USA. Today we're going to make a plant-based beet pokey plate. Pokey simply means to cut crosswise. So we're going to cut multicolored beets crosswise and we're going to shingle them on a plate with blood oranges, crispy shiitake mushrooms, of course Kikoman pokey sauce ready to use and then we're just gonna microplane some macadamia nuts on top. The base of our pokey is three types of beets. Here I have roasted and peeled ruby, golden, and chioga beets that I've cut into quarter inch slices using a mandolin. For the orange slices, cut the peeled oranges crosswise in quarter inch circles, removing any seeds you might find. Next, we'll prepare our crispy shiitake mushrooms. 
I've sliced the shiitake caps as thinly as possible. Heat a non-stick skillet over medium-high heat and drizzle with Kikoman toasted sesame oil, heating until it smokes. Add the sliced shiitakes and saute until they are caramelized and crispy. Shingle beets and orange slices, alternating with different colors. Drizzle pokey sauce across the top of the beets and oranges and scatter with crispy shiitake mushrooms and tarragon leaves. Finish the plate with macadamia dust and orange zest from a microplane. So here you have a delicious plant-based beet pokey plate. I hope you enjoy. Hi, I'm Tony Roberts. I'm the pastry chef at the Ritz-Carlton Chicago. Today we're celebrating the worlds of flavor with the perfect puree of Napa Valley. So we're going to start the day in Montreal for breakfast with black pepper ham and Emmental crepes with the perfect puree peach ginger blend and maple sauce. And then we're gonna follow up with the butter. I'm gonna switch to a whisk here. Just get the butter in and just whisk until the butter is melted in. And Emmental cheese and ham, we're gonna give it a fold, give it another fold. So we're just gonna pour this right over the top. And then to finish, some fresh black pepper and some chopped herbs. Today I have some chive and there you go a beautiful brunch or breakfast dish. Next up on our culinary journey, we're stopping in Mexico City for vegetarian cauliflower tacos with a peach ginger slaw. We are going to add our peach ginger blend. So here we have our coleslaw, everything's in. We have our peach ginger blend, it smells so good. Some white vinegar, fresh lime juice, and some toasted chopped pepitas. So we're just gonna take our plate here. I have our warm corn tortillas. I'm gonna do a little bit of the spicy mayo, a few crispy fried onions, and there you have it. Roasted cauliflower tacos with the peach ginger slaw. So we're finishing our day with some sweets in Sao Paulo. And go ahead and blend it smooth. So here we have our brigadero mixture. And then from here, just use a little ice cream scoop or you can use a spoon or something else. And you're just going to make little balls, pop them out and then in your hands, roll them nicely into a little ball. And here I have some yellow nonpareil sprinkles and some orange to celebrate the peach ginger colors. And we're just gonna take our little ball Roll it in here, cover it in the sprinkles. And then these just get placed in bonbon cups, ready for your guests. I've had so much fun on this culinary journey with the perfect puree of Napa Valley. We began our day in Montreal where we made black pepper ham and Emmental crepes with a peach ginger sauce. Next up, we headed to Mexico City to prepare vegetarian roasted cauliflower tacos with a peach ginger slaw. Then we ended our day with sweets and San Palio with peach ginger brigaderos. Again, all of these recipes can be found at www.perfectpuree.com wof. 
While you're there, remember to check out our complimentary sample program and try all of the flavors for yourself. Enjoy.